Hello, I'm B. Groves McDaniel and uh, maybe um, a little bit about me might be a useful thing before we even start. I have been a teacher in further adult and higher education for around 34, 35 years. Um, um, I was first qualified back in 1986-87 uh, but was teaching before that in um, a voluntary capacity. I am particular is particularly associated with the Workers' Educational Association um, where I have been a tutor, volunteer, member of staff, etc for a very long time, since at least 1984. So I've been around WEA and around the adult education system um, for most of my professional life. I am it's also... Five in the afternoon. <laughs> that's, my, that's my clock. I am also a fully qualified teacher. I have a first class honours degree in, in teaching and the philosophy of teaching and education. My specialism is in the theory of uh, the philosophy of, of learning as a process and also I have a licensiate of the city and guilds. And one time back in 2000 I was awarded tutor of the year for the North East and in, um, after the, later on I was uh, president of the professional institute for learning, which was uh, um, the professional body for, for teachers and further in adult uh, education. I was twice elected as president. Now the reason I tell you all of this is because at the end of the day, if I'm going to make this video, I guess I need to have some sort of position from which I, I'm starting to give this talk. And I need you to know exactly whether I'm credible or not. Of course being qualified and experienced doesn't necessarily give you utter credibility, but it at least gives you a foundation from which you can probably talk with a certain degree of, of assurance. Also I'm motivated by a certain degree of frustration in that I spend an awful lot of time in, in adult learning and at the same time find that there is a considerable degree of well, let me put it this way, problematic information related to how the process of learning operates, which I think needs to be talked about, and hence this video. This video is about the principles and practice of adult teaching and learning from my point of view. Uh, my point of view being one that I've just described prior in the earlier part of this video. So I'm coming to you from this point of this position. I'm hoping that that gives you some foundation as to why maybe you might want to take a little bit of interest in what, what I've got to say about the subject. There are three issues I suppose that I want to talk about. First in principle what adult learning is because I think that's, that's something which is not clear within the profession and I think something that needs to be looked at in a greater degree of detail. Secondly how that process and principle of defining what adult learning is affects what we do in classroom and other learning situations. And thirdly, what the role of assessment is in the process of classroom work, workshop experiences and so on and so forth. These three points are all interlocked with one another but I hope you find that they actually form three separate domains which I, can, which I want to comment on. First of all, the principle of adult learning. Uh, there has been, I suppose, a tradition in the Western world, I'm not 100% certain whether it's the same throughout the planet, but certainly in the Western world, which you could call the didactic tradition. The didactic tradition is a very old one, and it's based upon Lockean ideas of the human being. The idea that, that uh, human beings are tabula rasa, they are blank slates upon which the world can write things. And because they're tabula rasa, 
they ha have an exa they have to really go through a process of education in which information is given to the person concerned that the process of learning and teaching is one in which the knowledge of the current generation is passed on to the next generation in a process of didacticism in which things are said and done and can be absorbed by the individual who are going through the learning process. Absorption, in a sense, is a bit like thinking the person has been in a kind of sponge without any water in it. What you have to do is get the sponge to absorb the water. And in the traditional view, that is almost like pouring this liquid of learning <laughs> onto the individual. You often hear teachers, even today, you'd often, you often hear teachers saying, Things such as, uh, I had to get it inside their heads, or I needed to get them to take this on board, or I needed to get them to take to absorb it. Those very words refer to a didactic process which is based upon this traditional concept. In addition, this traditional concept has got roots in Cartesianism, it has roots in the idea that somehow the mind is separate from the body and therefore we have to somehow find some way of getting at the mind in the process of um, helping individuals to learn. That also what we have to do is access the memory, make sure things are remembered in the process of learning. And that, well, how do we find out whether something has been learned a lot? Well, what we have to do is go through the process of, going, of, of generating recall. Many of us have had this issue. Many of us have this issue with regard to the way in which we're tested in, in the educational process. The testing as we know it, assessment as we know it, is either, from the current process, either one of two things. It's either instrumental or it's punitive. In other words, learning is tested on the basis of uh, finding, uh, you know, finding out whether, whether you meet a standard and, 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 and criteria for a particular qualification. Or it's used as a way of ensuring that you actually do the learning by punishing you if you don't. Sometimes the two things are combined. I remember when I was a youngster uh, being at school and a physics teacher I had told us to copy out the entire contents of a, uh, of a, of a physics textbook over our summer holidays. And the process of doing that, he spoiled my holiday for me. I will never forgive him for that. And he never looked at the work when we handed it in, it was just done punitively. Nevertheless, and what is really weird about that is you would have thought at least I might have learned something in terms of memory. In fact, I can't remember anything I ever copied up uh, during that period. Instrumentally, of course, we go through processes when we, we work towards, towards qualifications and exams. And I think one of the biggest issues we have now with regard to uh, learning in the early 21st century is because of neoliberalism throughout the world our concept of what learning might be and how it is valued within the world is gauged by the business of qualifications in other words we respect those most who have got the most qualifications since really there is a kind of irony about my me reciting qualifications and experience earlier on so all i'm doing is 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 going through the motions of that instrumentality that at the end of the day we are we're kind of stuck with at the moment. However, having let us let us let us rephrase all of that. Let's let's rethink about all of this. Certainly, what is definitely the case is over the past forty years, the re-examination of education and especially the learning principle has led to some radically different views about what learning actually is and what its purpose is within society. One of the great adventures and the great achievements of this, for instance was in the work of Jean Lave and Etienne Wenger back in, that, in the early 1990s, in which they collaborated on some global research, which led to a book called Situated Learning, The Digital Peripheral Participation. From my point of view, this is one of the key books of the late 20th century, and in terms of learning, altered the game with regard to what learning was supposed to be. They weren't the only people to do that. Other... Uh, uh, psychologists and, 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 and philosophers have done something similar. You could go back to the work of, of Lev Vygotsky, for instance, or look at the, uh, uh, at the work of, of many a, a, a constructivist uh, philosopher 
over the past 40, 50, 60 years since World War II and get similar sorts of ideas as you get with situated learning. What situated learning did was couch this whole process of what learning was on globalised research across cultures which were not necessarily Western cultures. So Leif and Wenger were very interested in both how, not just how the features of westernised, that's European and American learning systems operate, but also how they operated in Africa, Middle East and the Far East and so on and so forth, and also in areas where learning was not necessarily the, the whole point of what was happening, though it was a peripheral version of the of the process. So for instance they looked at um, uh, alcoholics in the United States and they looked at how uh, how people stopped drinking by learning how not to drink. And that was not based on the business of any didacticism, it was based upon the business of people being in, placed in situations where they were associated with people who also were non-drinkers and became associated and learned how to behave as non-drinkers within those kinds of, 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 of criteria, within those kinds of domains, within those kinds of, of processes that non-drinkers were associated with. He looked at tailors in Nigeria and how tailors learned through a process of being alongside other experienced tailors and learning by, not so much by, on the basis of imitation but learning the, the behaviours that produced the kind of quality tailoring which at the end of the day allowed them to join this group of individuals who were experienced tailors. They learned about uh, uh, nurses in Mexico and Central America and so on and so forth. It, there are many instances in the book. Please do go out and, and buy it and read it or at least borrow it and read it because I think it's one of the key books in, in uh, about learning. And what it illustrates is something which I think is, is very crucial to the position that I, I hold and that is learning is not something that happens in the individual head. Learning is not something that happens between individuals. It is not a function of some mysterious process in the brain. Memory is part of it, but it's only part of it in the sense that when we need to recall individual things in an active way. Most of us don't recall things in an active way once we've learned them. I'll give you an example. When you're driving a car, I mean, you must remember, you, won't, you may remember when you first learned to drive a car. When you're learning to drive a car, when you're actually driving a car, most of the time you don't recall what it is you're supposed to be doing. Most of us don't try functionally to recall what it's like to be able to put one's hands on the wheel or move one's hands on the on the on the on the uh, pedals or to operate the handbrake or or if you're driving a manual uh, use the gear stick those processes come automatically and you know you've learned them because they do come automatically that process itself you learn by being associated with someone and engaging in the same sort of practices that that person was involved in. You became part of a group called drivers and the process of becoming that, the processes were become became habituated within you. Those particular pro processes of habituation became second nature to the point where you didn't have to think about them at all. Memory played only a random and peripheral part in that, in circumstances where if there was a demand to remember what was going on. Most of us, when we're actually doing things like an emergency stop, don't think about it at all. And if we had to, we wouldn't be able to do it. So what I'm trying to get at is the depths of learning are not based upon the, the business of the standard deductive mentalist, instrumentalist process, but something much more subtle than that. Something about the communicative factor between individuals within groups, and something about the way in which those factors encourage certain kinds of social behaviours which at the end of the day provide us with a framework within which a learning person becomes something. Learning is becoming. So how do we encourage with good learning based upon this principle? We're now into, into, into stage, stage a sec, uh, into part two. Well, you would set up situations in which it's possible for someone to engage with others who are also engaged in the same process of learning that they are and share what they know. In many respects this could be through joint practical exercises, it could be through considerable amounts of discussion. In philosophy for instance, if I'm teaching philosophy, what I'm trying to teach is not, I don't know, not trying to teach the facts about uh, René Descartes or, or Plato or, or Wittgenstein or, or Bertrand Russell, I'm not trying to teach them about 
these persons' lives or what these people said, what I'm trying to do is for them to engage with the topics that they themselves, as philosophers, engage with, and for them to be able to get into the habit, in a real sense, get into the habit of becoming like Russell and Wittgenstein and Plato and John Locke and da 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 in the process of doing that, what they're doing is learning not so much about the, 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 the inform informative aspects of, of philosophy, the, the information uh, or, the, or the content of philosophy, but learning the practice of it, learning how to talk the talk, learning how to ask the right questions, learning how to be a philosopher rather than learning about philosophy. And I think that's the key feature of, the, of what I might call the, the, the more precise view of what learning is and how it affects teaching. Consequently, one can conceive of teaching and the processes of teaching as being about organizing situations in which individuals can in, immerse themselves and gain those sorts of practices and concepts, communicational habits, ways of talking, ways of acting, which at the end of the day create this thing that we call learning and recognize as being part of ourselves. That process is very much a practical and engaging one, and it's very much about the business of being part of a learning group which has a singular degree of control over how it works and how it operates as a, as a group. So how does this refer back to, to instrumentalism? Well, in a process like that, you can still have instrumentalism. There's nothing stopping you, for instance, working towards a qualification using these, these processes. And I can't see any reason why that should be an issue. It, it, but what it does is it say the process of getting there is not about the business of simply regurgitate, regurgitating what one has remembered. And, I, and, 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 and consequently, there is an impact upon the way in which assessment as a process uh, it works and how it's visualised. How is it visualized? Well, it's based upon the assessment becomes part and parcel of the learning process and a singularly important part of it as well. There is something that Dylan William once said, which was this business of uh, assessment for learning, not assessment about learning. So assessment for learning means that a person's, ex to a certain extent, examined, if that's the right word, or, 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 or considered in terms of what have they learned and where do they need to go next, rather than saying, I really do think you should meet this particular standard and I really do think that, 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 that you have to cram more into your brain and I really do think at the end of the day that, the end, that you should be focusing on this one day when we're handing in the work or that's one day when we're having the exam. For assessment for learning, the processes of learning are deeply engaged in how the, the tutor, the, the trainer or whatever, works with the learners. Can consequently, one of the most important aspects of that, for instance, is the diagnostic process of learning in the early stages when you first game, come to meet individuals within their learning groups. It's very important that you get, you know, for teachers to get to know their students, very important for teachers to be able to understand what their needs are, not so much what they want, but how they feel about the whole process of learning itself, what they're frightened of, what they're encouraged by, what they enjoy doing, how they enjoy talking to others, which areas of, of the learning process they find most difficult to take on board. And sometimes those are areas are not necessarily anything to do with the subject matter, but how they feel about themselves as individuals. It's what I might call the educating reader process. The idea being that somehow there is something peculiar going on, uh, which means that a person can often fail at learning, not because of they can't tackle the subject, but because their background, their sense of self, just make, gives, puts a distance between them and the kind of groups that they need to engage with in order to be feel part of, of, of a system where they can progress. So the, when we're working with individuals in, work, in learning groups, it's very important how the group works and functions as, a, as an entity. It's very important how people progress within it. It's very important how the hierarchical and relational structures within particular groups are seen as being manageable by the individual concerned and also protected and, and, and monitored very carefully by the person who is mostly, mostly responsible for the learning process, namely the tutor. 
So for, for, for assessment, assessment shifts its focus away from the instrumentalism and punitive sides of things, which we become kind of almost practiced in, towards the whole business of engaging with the progressive way that the group operates. We need to hand over assessment from being something which is pure, primarily something that's done to the students as to, to be something which is used as a support, supportive technique in order to ensure that students get engagement in the way that works for them. Another aspect of assessment which is problematic is this idea of the learning outcome. The big problem with the learning outcome is the learning outcome is based and predicated on both the instrumental process and the old didactic system. What, the, what we need is a set of moving goalposts, as you might say, because when people come into learning for the first time, they suddenly discover that though they may be able to tell you what their aims are, within the short time, whether when the, their learning processes have got underway, when they become engaged with the group, very often those learning outcomes become redundant, and either they've got a whole new different set, or there is a shifting set of goalposts which they've, in which they retarget their new process as they go along. You can never tell, for instance, how someone's going to come out of a learning engagement. You, you, can, you may find that what they say they, they want out of it at the very start is something totally different towards the end. Consequently, it's most important to, to, co to look, about, look at the process rather than its outcomes. Its outcomes, to a certain extent, can be assessed retrospectively. That is to say, based upon how things were at the very start and looking at where someone has got with, in reference to the process itself. This whole business, therefore, has turned assessment to a certain extent on its head. It has become more diagnostic than it has become summative. And I think this is a really good thing. I think it's a really good thing because it means that the engagement that students and tutors have with it can be much more constructive than it has been in, in other eras. What about online learning? Ah, online learning. You know the interesting thing about online learning is it has major faults. Firstly, it's one of its major faults. It's incapacity to be able to generate learning groups. Learning groups themselves need multiple, multiple channels of communication which allow the students to engage with each other in terms of writing down things, speaking about things, practicing them, arguing about them, moving around the room, using resources of various types. Multiple channels of communication which at the end of the day enable a learner to jump around in multiple dimensions in order to engage with the subject and engage with those who are engaging with it. In other words, their fellow learners and the, and the tutor. When you're engaging with, with online learning, it shrinks the number of communicational channels down to a screen, visuals, and not even 3D visuals, but two-dimensional dish visuals, and sound. Fortunately, this is kind of problematic. It's also not quite the way it should be in, in terms of its liveness, in the sense that when we're normally engaging with others on a face-to-face on a -face basis, we are engaging with them not just three-dimensionally, but also in the process of a rapidly changing communication exchange process in which the process of, 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 of learning is a two-way feedback simultaneously and based upon multiple case, occasions of communication. In online learning, that's not the case. What is even worse is that many online learning systems have failed to take, it, to take some of these basic principles on board so they've actually forgotten totally about the business of what diagnostic assessment might do it might be. They've failed to provide sufficient amounts of interactivity. They've become horrendously didactic and also horrendously punitive in the process they operate. Very often the kind of outcomes at the end are seen as punishment for not taking notice rather than seeing this as a positive outcome of taking board on board the engagement with the subject matter, which is what this is supposed to be about. Organisations who fail to take this on board have lost the plot. They really need to start remembering some of these basic ideas and they really start to need to start thinking from, thinking about all the learning techniques and the channels by which they communicate with their students as important in their own right rather than just seeing them as a means to an end in terms of meeting someone else's external standards which may or may not be appropriate to the individual's concerned. 
deductive dictatorships do not work. People will go through the motions, but the bottom line about it all, they probably at the end of the day will either not get anything out it out of it, or even if they did, they'll get something negative out of it, which was the idea of frustration, um, condescension, and a sense of boredom. And that's the last thing we need in circumstances in which people need to be encouraged to be independent, socially engaged learners, which is exactly what we do need at the present, uh, respective of the kind of uh, systems of engagement that we've got. I shall leave it there. I hope you found this interesting. I've not wanted to be too boring about the subject. I just wanted to put things into practice and then hopefully you now understand exactly why I am the kind of person I am with regard to teaching and learning and why I believe what I believe. Please get back to me with questions or comments or whatever. Um, always interested in hearing from people and uh, I uh, am looking forward to getting back into the classroom, the classroom again once all this terrible lockdown is over. Take care out there, stay safe, stay well, thank you very much. <laughs>